Good afternoon. This is Kyle Welch with RCR Wireless News. I want to thank everyone for attending Understanding Common Sources of Interference in LTE Networks, presented by Rodi and Schwarz. Our presenter today is Paul Denisowski, Application Engineer at Rodi and Schwarz. Just a reminder to all of our attendees that within 24 hours of this webinar, we will provide you with a link to the on-demand version of today's webinar. During the webinar, we encourage everyone to submit their questions via the control panel, which will then be asked uh, at the end of the, the webinar. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Paul. Well, hello everyone and welcome to Understanding Common Sources of Interference in LTE Networks. My name is Paul Denisowski and I'm an Applications Engineer with Rodian Schwartz, where I specialize in interference hunting and direction finding. We've delivered a number of webinars on the general principles of interference hunting and direction finding, but in this webinar we're going to concentrate on the most common sources of interference in LTE networks, using real-world examples from field work we've done with network operators around the United States. Let's begin by talking about what we mean by interference hunting. In the most general sense, interference hunting is the art and science of both identifying and locating sources of radio frequency interference. As the number of and the importance of wireless devices increases, the importance of interference hunting has also increased, and this is especially true in the case of cellular network operators. Interference affects our ability to use wireless communication systems, with the effects ranging from a mild decrease maybe in overall network effectiveness, for example, slightly reduced throughput, all the way up to a complete failure of the network. But most interference issues tend to fall somewhere in the middle. Now, generally speaking, there are two phases in interference hunting. The first involves determining that interference is in fact taking place and the rough geographical location of the interferer. In cellular networks, this is relatively straightforward since the base station statistics such as uplink RSSI will often narrow down the location to a single sector or a small number of sectors. This is also what I like to call the driving around phase since often you have to go out and drive the sector, so to speak, in order to narrow down the location of the interferer. The second phase is what I refer to as the local or walking around phase. At this point, you've typically narrowed down the location of the interferer to about 100 meters or so, maybe a building, and then continue the hunt on foot using portable receivers and handheld antennas. Now, this methodology applies to pretty much all interference hunting, so let's talk about what makes LTE different. LTE stands for long-term evolution and is the predominant 4G cellular technology. The main advantage that LTE offers over 2G and 3G technologies such as GSM, UMTS, CDMA 2K, etc., at least from the end user point of view, is better speed and throughput. Some of the original design goals of LTE were to provide up to 300 megabits per second in the downlink and 75 megabits per second in the uplink. LTE also supports much shorter round trip times, which is important for real time or near real time services such as voice over LTE or Volte, streaming video, etc. LTE service is currently available throughout the United States, usually from multiple network operators in any given market and consumers are upgrading in large numbers to LTE-capable devices. And while the actual throughput rates for a given subscriber in a live network are usually considerably less than the theoretical maximum, the data rates are typically at least an order of magnitude or better than those found on 3G networks. One important thing to note, too, is that while we may tend to think of LTE as a commercial service provided to consumers, there are plans to deploy LTE in government and military networks as well. In particular, spectrum in the 700 megahertz band has been allocated for public safety applications, such as police, fire, and other first responders. And the FCC has mandated that LTE be used as the radio access technology for these allocations. So as you might imagine, interference to public safety LTE services could have consequences that are far greater than those in commercial networks. So on a technical level, though, how is LTE different from previous radio access technologies such as GSM, UMTS, etc.? For the purposes of interference hunting, these differences can be classified into four main areas, namely the frequencies at which LTE is commonly deployed in the United States, the types of modulation used and the associated noise flow requirements, the bandwidth of the LTE signals, and the use of remote radio heads. And we're going to discuss each one of these in detail over the next few slides. Let's begin with frequency allocations. As we all know, spectrum is a valuable but finite commodity, and most of the initial LTE deployments took place in spectrum that had been refarmed. That is, the previous occupants of that spectrum were moved to different frequencies in order to make room for the new services, that is, LTE. In the United States, these frequencies were generally in the 700 megahertz band, at least in the initial deployments, 
And these are lower in frequency than bands traditionally used for cellular service in 2G and 3G networks. Why is this important? Well, generally speaking, lower frequencies propagate or travel further than higher frequency signals. Lower frequency signals also tend to have better penetration through things such as buildings. And while this may be desirable in many cases, it also has an important implication in terms of interference hunting in a number of ways. The footprint of a given base station will, of course, be larger, meaning a, a bigger area in which you can look for sources of interference. Better propagation also applies to the interfering signals themselves as well. They can travel further and pass through objects better than their higher frequency counterparts. There are plans at present to refarm the 600 megahertz range for use with LTE, and these signals, of course, being lower frequency, will have even better propagation and penetration than those at 700 megahertz. At present, LTE deployments are planned for other bands, such as 800, uh, 1700, 2100, or AWS, 1900, 2500 megahertz, and others. And while these bands will have different propagation characteristics, many of these applications also involve spectrum refarming. And as we learned during the 700 megahertz deployments of LTE, spectrum refarming often involves a lengthy period of tracking down sources that didn't get the memo, so to speak. We mentioned before that LTE's main benefit was increased throughput. And one way that this is obtained is through the use of higher order modulation, such as using 64 QAM in the downlink. But as in all communication systems, higher order modulation schemes typically require a cleaner RF environment that is one with a lower noise floor and fewer interferers. If the level of noise or interference rises in an LTE network, the network will typically drop to lower order modulation schemes, 16 QAM or worst case QPSK, thus essentially negating the advantages of using LTE. High bit error rates will also significantly degrade throughput. In short, LTE does require a much cleaner RF environment and a lower noise floor than traditional 2G or 3G environments. Uh, for example, in this screenshot, we see that the scheduled throughput for this UE, this user equipment, this phone, is very low, only a few hundred kilobits per second. And this is mostly, most likely due to the high block error rate, the blur, and the almost exclusive use of QPSK, the lowest order modulation scheme in LTE. Again, not a good situation for anyone. Another way that LTE increases throughput is by using wider channel bandwidths. LTE supports different channel bandwidths in order to allow it to fit into existing spectrum allocations. But the trend is towards larger channel bandwidths, such as 10 megahertz or 20 megahertz. And while the use of these wider bandwidths increases the overall performance of the LTE network, this also means a wider range of frequencies that has to be checked for interference. For example, instead of simply looking within a 1.5 megahertz CDMA channel, I now have to search a 10 or perhaps 20 megahertz wide channel. And this places much stricter requirements on the instruments that are used to find interferers in the LTE networks. Ideally, we'd like, of course, our instruments to be as fast as possible in order to cover this entire band, this wider bandwidth, with a very high probability of intercept. In other words, we want to be sure we don't miss anything, especially if what we're looking for are intermittent or low-level signals. In the case of interference of cellular networks, one of the best places to start looking is at the base station itself. Many 2G and 3G base stations have so-called sniffer ports, RF sniffer ports, that allow you to see the spectrum as the base station antennas see it. This is really a tremendous advantage since you can use large band matched antennas mounted very high above the ground, that is the base station antennas, to look for the interferer. However, many LTE deployments are making use of what are called remote radio heads, where the electronics are all mounted up on the tower and the data is carried to the ground over a fiber optic, usually CIPRI based link. This means that in systems using remote radio heads, we often do not have a way of seeing the interferer from the ground near the base station, and we don't know what kind of signal we're looking for. Some base stations do provide a rough way to view power per LTE resource block, but in many cases, we now have no choice but to drive the sector and search a relatively wide frequency span looking for the interfering signal. There are some other things to keep in mind regarding interference hunting in cellular networks. The most important of these is that interference hunting is almost exclusively an uplink issue. That is, in the spectrum used by the mobiles when communicating with a base station. While that is possible for interference to impair the LTE downlink signals, in practice this is relatively rare and would be difficult to detect without actually turning off the base station. Interference in the uplink generally causes problems because it impairs the base station's ability to hear the relatively weak signals being sent by the UEs. The good news is that the base stations normally can detect the presence of interference in the uplink frequency band. Uh, for example, an excessively high RSSI, received signal strength, or poor performance in certain KPIs, such as throughput or call retainability, 
In other words, the base station typically knows that some kind of interference is present when that interference takes place in the uplink frequency band. Now let's talk about common interference types in LTE. What are the most common sources of interference in LTE networks in the United States? Based on my own field work and conversations with pretty much all of the network operators, I would say there are five main categories of common interferers in LTE networks. And these are spurious emissions, wireless microphones, bidirectional amplifiers, cable egress, and fluorescent lighting. We're going to discuss each one of these in detail with examples taken from actual cases of LT interference that I found in the field. The first category is the most generic and certainly not specific to LTE, namely spurious emissions. Although different people define this term in different ways, I'm going to use the term spurious emissions to refer to things such as harmonics, intermodulation products, and basically any unintentional emission from an electronic device. Now, it would be very difficult to provide a short description of what spurious emissions look like, since they can have a very, very wide variety of shapes and behaviors. For example, they can be narrow bands, such as the example on the left, which happens to be moving back and forth in frequency as well, or they can be wide bands, such as the example on the right. They may be constant, they may be intermittent. Uh, there's a wide variety of characteristics that they can take on. And while this type of interference is common to pretty much all types of networks and services, there is one LTE-specific aspect that you should definitely be aware of. LTE uses certain portions of its bandwidth, that is, certain resource blocks, to carry control and signaling information. In the LTE uplink, these would be things such as the PUSCH and PRATCH channels. And even a relatively weak narrowband interferer can cause significant problems in an LTE network if it happens to fall on these same frequencies that are used for carrying control and signaling information and therefore impairs the ability of the UE to send control information to the network. And we've seen this in many markets in many different situations, so it definitely is a real potential issue for LTE networks. Here are a few more examples of spurious emissions in LTE networks. The wavy pattern on the left is typical of oscillating signal sources, such as the amplified television antenna shown. It's actually been very surprising to me personally to see how many people are still using these types of antennas to pick up over-the-air television and how often interference has been traced back to these types of antennas. Note that generally speaking, signals which move back and forth in frequency or oscillate often imply the presence of some sort of oscillating amplifier. The spectrum on the right is typical of a wideband emission caused by a common office printer or copier. Again, in the case of spurious emissions, there's almost no limit as to the kinds of devices that can create interference. Pretty much everything that runs on electricity, anything that has an on-off switch, is a suspect. An excellent example of the somewhat imperfect nature of spectrum refarming is wireless microphones. Although the FCC mandated that the use of 700 megahertz wireless microphones be discontinued following the allocation to 700 megahertz of LTE, it has taken a significant amount of time to locate and remove these microphones, some of which have a surprisingly high output level for a handheld device that runs on batteries. Even the good news is, of course, that these devices generally use narrowband FM modulation, and this simplifies audio demodulation of the signal. With the proper receiver, you can listen to, or in some cases, even record the audio, and this is extremely helpful when locating these devices. Uh, audio recording is very helpful in that it's difficult for someone to argue with a recording of their own voice and claim that they're actually not the source of the interference. In this slide, we see a Shure wireless microphone whose transmit range includes the upper half of uh, LTE band 13. Again, not a good situation. Bidirectional amplifiers, BDA, some people will call them signal boosters, are another very common source of interference in, L in cellular networks, both for LTE and for 2G and 3G networks. Uh, again, these devices, which, as I mentioned, the FCC calls signal boosters, and which some people also refer to as cell phone repeaters, are designed to improve reception by amplifying and retransmitting both the uplink and downlink signals. This is very useful when you have an area that normal cellular signals have difficulty reaching, especially inside structures. And BDAs can be installed both by the network operators themselves and by subscribers, the so-called self-installs. In order to function properly and not cause interference, there has to be a certain level of path loss between the donor antenna, that is the one that's pointed at the base station, and the serving antenna, the one that's inside the area served by the BDA. Usually this path loss requirement is met by making sure that these two antennas are far enough apart and through the use of a highly directional donor antenna. Problems, of course, occur when insufficient path loss causes the signals to loop around and causes the BDA to oscillate. 
when BDAs begin to oscillate, they typically raise the noise floor over their entire operating range for a given band. This shows up in spectrum as a wide spectral hump, um, often between, say, 10 to 40 megahertz wide, possibly with narrowband products within this range as well. BDAs for the 700 megahertz frequency bands used for LTE have been available for some time, and the screenshots on this slide show oscillating BTAs in two different LTE frequency bands. Note that using a wider spectral span, say 50 megahertz or so, makes it much easier to recognize the presence of an oscillating BDA based on its shape alone. And while we normally detect the presence of BDAs by looking at the uplink spectrum, again, where we have most of our issues, it's also possible to detect the presence of a BDA by looking at the downlink spectrum. How? Well, if you enter a building or other area that you wouldn't expect to have very good cellular coverage, and notice that the downlink level begins to increase significantly, this is often a very good sign that some form of BDA is being used in that area. There are also many visual indications that can provide strong clues as to the presence of BDAs. Recall that a BDA requires both a donor antenna pointed at the base station and a serving antenna providing serving service to the usually indoor area. And therefore, the presence of a directional antennas such as Yagi's, panels, etc., and even some vertical antennas could be a sign of a BDA installation. This is particularly true for structures with very high attenuation. A Yagi on a concrete or sheet metal building may mean that a BDA is being used to provide service inside of this highly shielded structure. Serving antennas inside of buildings are usually ceiling mounted dome or panel antennas, although these can be tricky to recognize. One widespread form of interference that is more or less unique to LTE is egress or leakage from cable television systems. As you probably know, cable systems transmit signals using the same frequencies that are used by many over the air services. But this does not create any issues as long as these signals remain within the cable. However, signals leaking from cables or other devices can cause interference, and this is particularly true for LTE deployments, especially at 700 megahertz. One of the main reasons that cable egress has become an issue in the United States is that the frequencies used by cable systems typically extend up to at least 750 megahertz, sometimes all the way up to a gigahertz. This means that there's frequency overlap between the signals used by cable systems and at least some of the spectrum used in the LTE bands in the 700 megahertz range. Another reason that this is an important issue is the lower noise for requirements for LTE. A cable leak into, say, the 850 megahertz spectrum used for GSM would most likely not cause the service degradation that a similar egress level would cause to LTE -NA services. And lastly, the sheer number of cable leaks in an average metropolitan or even rural area means a higher probability of having one near an E-node B. Note too that although cable companies are becoming aware of this issue and are taking steps to address it, their efforts to date have been concentrated on finding analog leakage at VHF aeronautical frequencies down around 120 to 140 megahertz and not the digital signals, the QAM channels, affecting LTE at 700 megahertz. And in many cases, the cable companies lack the tools needed to detect these kinds of leaks and will rely on the cooperation of network operators in order to locate them and identify them and verify that they've been fixed. From a spectral point of view, it's very, very easy to recognize cable egress. In the 700 megahertz LTE frequency bands, the cable channels are transmitted as 6 megahertz wide QAM signals with a small guard band between them and roughly equal amplitude across the entire range. As you can see in these screenshots, cable egress has a very distinctive pattern in both spectrum and waterfall diagrams. Once you see spectrum like this, you can be pretty sure what you're looking for. Note too that as opposed to egress at lower frequencies, those VHF aeronautical frequencies we mentioned, cable leakage at 700 megahertz almost always originates from the hard line connected equipment, that is amplifiers, taps, splices, and the hard line itself. These leaked locations therefore can generate egress at very high signal levels. And one last point about looking at egress. In some cases, we will only see leakage over a very small frequency range. Perhaps only one or two channels will be visible. This typically occurs at the upper end of the spectrum. And although we're still studying exactly why that happens, we believe that it has to do with the nature of the fault, that some cracks, for example, act like a slot antenna and only let through higher frequency signals. The important thing here is that you check the entire frequency range for cable egress and not simply verify that egress is or is not present at one channel or one frequency. In addition to being very easy to recognize in spectrum, cable egress is also somewhat easy to find because there are a limited number of locations that cable signals can be coming from. If you're seeing cable signals, they must be coming from part of the cable TV infrastructure. 
as mentioned before, the most common physical sources of egress from cable systems are the lines, taps, and amplifiers, anything connected to the hard line. Leakage from taps and amplifiers is usually caused by loose covers. Unterminated lines, such as the one in the picture here on the bottom right, um, can actually act as antennas, uh, creating very widespread egress issues. Damage to cables can also come from a variety of sources. The bottom left picture shows damage to a cable caused, believe it or not, by an animal chewing on it. Uh, far more frequent occurrence than you might suspect. Uh, please keep in mind also that cables may be overhead or may be buried, and in some cases we've seen underground cable breaks that can lead to substantial egress levels over the air. Although it's not the biggest source of interference in LTE networks, fluorescent lighting is certainly the best known source of interference, at least to the general public. The mainstream media has reported quite a few cases of fluorescent lighting interfering with LTE networks, and in some cases this has led to intervention and even fines. On the technical side, the interference generated by fluorescent lighting systems is actually caused not by the light bulbs themselves, but by the associated ballasts. And despite the fact that many of these stories in the mainstream media will report that the ballast from one particular manufacturer, who will remain unnamed, is often the culprit, the fact is we've seen LT interference from a wide variety of ballast types and manufacturers. Unfortunately for the owner of these ballasts, there's really no easy way to fix the interference they generate, and the ballasts usually have to be replaced. Like most forms of interference generated by unmodulated signals, unintentional signals, the spectral characteristics of interference generated by fluorescent lighting ballasts can vary significantly in terms of their frequency, power, and width. Generally speaking, the emissions are roughly 200 kilohertz wide and are often slightly frequency unstable, at least in my experience. In some cases, the signals that are causing interference in the 700 megahertz LT bands are actually harmonics of lower frequency emissions from these ballasts in which case it's often easier to track down the fundamental or lower order harmonics since it will be more powerful and will tend to propagate further than the higher frequency harmonics, say at 700 megahertz. One final note is that in some cases, time of day is a good indicator that interference is being generated by fluorescent lighting, especially if the interference only occurs at night, on rainy days, etc. Now we've gone over the most common forms of interference currently seen in LTE networks, but I'd like now to discuss some of the forms of interference that we're most likely to see in LTE networks moving forwards. Obviously it's difficult to predict how important or how widespread these potential interference sources will be, but I feel fairly safe in stating that there will be plenty of real world examples of these interferers within the next 18 to 24 months, perhaps in time for the next webinar. Uh, while it's not a source of interference per se, spectrum refarming will continue to play an important role in LTE interference issues in the near future. As I mentioned previously, spectrum clearing is never 100% effective, so making sure that previous users are vacated from refarm spectrum will continue to be important. LTE's frequency ba flexible bandwidths allow uh, deployment in bands currently used by 2G and 3G networks, but one should keep in mind that these older radio access technologies tend to be more tolerant of noise and other interferers than LTE. What this essentially means is that just because a band is working fine for GSM doesn't mean that it'll work fine when that spectrum is switched over to LTE. One of the main features of LTE Advanced, uh, also known as Release 10, is the use of multiple component carriers to increase bandwidth and throughput, something referred to as carrier aggregation. What this means from an interference hunting point of view is that the performance will now depend on signals in multiple bands, possibly separated by substantial different distances and frequency. And therefore, interference hunters will be required to police multiple bands. And this, of course, will also require the use of different antennas and different approaches due to the different propagation characteristics at different frequencies. Another potential source of interference to LTE is radar. Uh, some radar systems operate in or near the planned frequency allocations for LTE at 3.5 gigahertz. There have been numerous public studies that have shown that while LTE is unlikely to impair the proper functioning of radar systems, uh, radar systems are very likely to cause significant infer interference to LTE networks, uh, those operating, of course, near, nearby, both in terms of physical location and frequency. Throughout this presentation, we've mentioned that most LTE interference issues occur in the uplink as opposed to the downlink spectrum. At present, the vast majority of LTE deployments in the United States are FDD, or frequency division duplex, meaning that the LTE uplink and downlink are in physically separate frequency bands. In addition to the FDD method of running LTE, the LTE standards also specify a mode of operation called TDD, or time division duplex, in which the uplink and downlink signals share the same spectrum divided by time. TDD deployments can significantly complicate the process of identifying and locating interference. Uh, 
especially when the uplink to downlink distribution is weighed more heavily towards the downlink, and therefore the uplink is only visible for a very short periods of time. When interference hunting in so-called TD LTE networks, it may in fact be necessary to turn off the affected E node B or sector in order to be able to see the uplink interference. We've also mentioned cable television egress, which at present usually takes the form of six megahertz wide QAM channels that are always on and are relatively easy to identify in spectrum. One of the cable standards currently being developed, DOCSIS 3.1, uses very wide, about 192 megahertz, OFDM signals with narrow subcarriers and variable modulation schemes. I once heard someone refer to DOCSIS 3.1 as LTE over cable. What this means for interference hunting is that cable egress may very soon cease to be as easy to recognize and locate as the constant evenly spaced QAM channels that we see today. And the new modulation schemes being used by DOCSIS 3.1 will also have a much greater potential for interfering with LTE as well. And lastly, we touched at the very beginning on the fact that it's not just network operators using LTE. Spectrum has already been allocated in 700 megahertz to provide LTE services to public safety throughout the United States. This will greatly increase the need for effective LTE interference hunting and tools in order to avoid interference to these critical emergency services. It should be noted that interference rarely confines itself to neatly allocated bands. So the same interference issues that are affecting network operators at 700 megahertz in commercial networks are very likely to affect public safety LTE networks and vice versa. And while we've mentioned that LTE networks have more stringent requirements than 2G and 3G technologies in terms of noise and interferes, the LTE networks tend to be more sensitive to interferes at lower levels as well. As a practical matter, what this means is that often those interferes can't be seen until you're in relatively close proximity to them on the ground. The base station, of course, being high up in the air with big antennas can see them just fine. On the ground, you may only see them for very short distances, or the interferes may be only visible for a very short time while driving. As a result, in many cases, LTE interference hunting requires tools that are faster and more sensitive than those used in legacy cellular networks. The use of remote radio heads also means that much more time will be spent driving the sector to locate sources of interference because we may not have a good idea of what we're looking for in terms of spectral shape and characteristics. Lastly, short duration signals such as bursty transmissions or intermodulation products are very, very difficult to locate using manual direction finding techniques. The ability to take bearings automatically and compute the locations of intermittent interferers has become increasingly important when dealing with noise and interference in the noise and interference sensitive LTE deployments. The expression long-term evolution, in a sense, applies not just to the radio access technology itself, but also to the tools and techniques that we need to identify and locate interference. I'd like to mention that for those of you wishing to learn more about LT-specific interference issues and interference hunting in general, uh, Rody and Schwartz has an interference hunting learning center with videos, white papers, and other resources based on thousands of hours of actual interference hunting we've done. We've also developed an interference hunter app, and that contains a video library, screenshots of common interference types, interference tends to come back, frequency lookup tables, practical tips of the day, harmonic calculators, etc. And it's available free for both Android and iOS. I'd like to end by summarizing the main points of today's webinar. First, LTE differs from traditional 2G and 3G radio access technologies in a number of ways. New frequency allocations means that different propagation characteristics and different potential sources of interference, um, such as the case of spectrum refarming, will exist. The main benefit of LTE, namely the higher throughput and data rates, are only achievable when using higher order modulation types, and this in turn requires a cleaner RF environment. Despite their many benefits, radio, remote radio heads do have one drawback when it comes to interference hunting, and that is the lack of an RF sniffer port means that we have an inability to see the interferer as the base station sees it, and therefore we may not know ahead of time what kind of signal we're looking for as we're driving the affected area. As I mentioned, the in terms of the most common interference types in LTE networks, these can be grouped into roughly five categories. The first are old friends spurious emissions, um, and that's what we've been calling any unintentionally radiated signal from electronic devices. And again, I'm using this term to include things such as harmonics and intermodulation products, etc. The imperfect nature of spectrum refarming means that we still do come across wireless microphones at 700 megahertz. Although they're not normally in continuous operation, these wireless microphones and the interference they generate is relatively easy to diagnose and locate, especially if you have the ability to use audio demodulation of the signal. 
Interference from oscillating bidirectional amplifiers is, again, one of the most common interference types in 2G and 3G networks. And unfortunately, this is true in LTE networks as well. Despite some re recent regulatory action by the FCC and design modifications on the part of some BDA manufacturers, a uh, sizable percentage of LTE interference issues can be traced back to improperly installed or improperly operated or malfunctioning BDAs. Uh, cable egress, of course, has been around for decades, I believe since the 1970s, in fact. But the spectral overlap between cable systems and 700 megahertz LTE, together with LTE's lower tolerance for noise, has made this another major source of interference in LTE networks. Fortunately, as I mentioned, cable egress is relatively easy to identify in spectrum and to locate, although the sheer number of leaks in most metropolitan areas means you're very, very likely to come across this particular interferer. The good news is that the cable industry has begun to take steps to address this issue as well, and once the problem has been located, it's relatively cheap and easy to fix. And although it's not one of the most widespread in LTE interference issues, fluorescent lighting is certainly the best known, at least to the general public. Since the interference caused by lighting balance is primarily a design issue, there's little that can be done to address this issue short of actually replacing the offending devices. We also touched briefly on some other potential LTE interference issues that can play a more important role going forward. In particular, I would like to call attention yet again to the use of LTE in non-commercial applications, such as public safety, where interference can cause disruption to critical health and safety-related services. As public safety LTE is rolled out across the United States, there will be many opportunities for those of you working in the cellular industry to share your knowledge and your experience with those responsible for maintaining these public safety LTE networks. And lastly, it's important to remember that the phrase long-term evolution also applies to the tools and techniques that we use in interference hunting. The kinds of low-level and short-duration interferers that could be safely, well, more or less safely, ignored in traditional cellular networks can actually represent the bulk of interference sources in LTE. Fortunately, tools and systems have also evolved to meet the challenges of these new interference sources. And with that, we've come now to the end of our presentation, and we've reached the question and answer portion of our webinar. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, we've had a number of questions come in, and I encourage everyone to continue submitting their questions via the question panel. Uh, and also, uh, just a reminder that we will be emailing everyone, all the attendees, a link to the Interference Hunting Learning Center presented by Rodian and Schwartz. Um, so, Paul, the first question we got Based on your experience, how would you rank these interference sources in terms of most common to least common? <laughs> well, that actually depends somewhat on where you are geographically. I feel fairly safe in saying that number one and number two would be BDAs and cable egress. And really, it does somewhat depend on where you are. I, I don't think there's a particular concentration of BDAs in one part of the country versus another. But uh, cable egress, I've noticed, is geography dependent. Uh, sad to say that some cable systems are better maintained than others. And in some cable systems extend higher up in frequency than others. But I would say that the biggest ones are BDAs and cable egress, maybe tied for first. After that, I would probably call spurious emissions next, and then fluorescent lighting and wireless microphones would probably be tied for last. Okay, great. And to go along with that, we had a question. Next question? Yeah. We had a question to explain a bit more about what egress actually is. Ah, egress. So again, cable TV systems use frequencies typically from about five megahertz all the way up, depending on where you're living, to 750, 850 gigahertz. And it's fine that they're using the same frequencies in the cable that we're using over the air for services because they normally don't touch each other, right? The shielded nature of the cables and the infrastructure means that the cable networks can use free, the same frequencies that are being used for LTE. What can happen, though, is if the cable is damaged, that, that squirrel shoe is an excellent example. If the shielding is actually destroyed, uh, something isn't connected properly, a tap comes loose, a, a line cracks, the signals inside the cable, which may be fairly high level, can leak out. And these can cause a lot of interference in LTE because, again, they're very wide signals, they're always on, and they're very noise-like. And LTE, in a sense, is a very noise-like type of uh, radio access technology. So what we tend to mean here by egress is signals coming out of a cable television system, getting out into the air and getting into the allocated frequency ranges for LTE. Uh, there is a related issue ingress where signals can actually get into the cable plant, but uh, since we're talking about interference to LTE networks, we're, it's, we're not terribly concerned about that. It should be mentioned, too, that the responsibility for egress does, rely, does fall on the cable network operator. Uh, in other words, if their cable breaks open or cracks or has some other issue and spills out into the network, uh, they need to fix that because it's licensed spectrum. 
On the other hand, if your LTE signals happen to be getting into their cable plant, then that's not really your responsibility. You're allowed to use that spectrum, and the onus is on them to fix that. Uh, if this last slide is still the question and answer, the picture there is actually a picture of the absolute worst place in the world to have a cable leak. Uh, you can see the gentleman in the bucket, and across the street there is the tower and the <clears throat> tree. Uh, both of those have two base stations each on them, and you have a source of egress hanging from a wire across the street from them. So it, it's a very serious issue in some places. Uh, fortunately, again, it's easy to find and relatively easy to fix. Okay, great. Um, the next question, what kind of analyzer do you use to measure spurious emissions? Well, traditionally, people have used spectrum analyzers, so swept or heterodyne type analyzers. Um, personally, for interference hunting, I use a reportable receiver. Rodian Schwartz makes both. We make spectrum analyzers and we make receivers. And the reason that I use a receiver, functionally, they provide you with similar information. One will provide you, both provide you rather, with spectrum and a waterfall, which I highly recommend using a waterfall or spectrogram to display as well. Uh, the reason that I personally tend to use a receiver for most of my work is because it's much faster and much more sensitive. And as I mentioned before, the problem that you have in LTE is you have very, very low-level interferers. You can be driving on the street and the signal is only visible for 50 meters, 100 meters. The base station can see it continuously because it's up very high and has huge antennas pointed at the ground that are matched for that band. And so the danger is, of course, that if you don't have a very fast receiver, you might drive right past it and it doesn't register on your instrument. So for that reason alone, I prefer the fastest and most sensitive instrument I can have. For older technologies, maybe not as important, but for LT, it, the speed is, is actually very, very important. And uh, as a matter of fact, we'll be releasing a white paper here shortly about that very issue. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, next question. Have you ever encountered 700 megahertz UL spurious emissions from large high power machinery such as conveyor systems? Oh, yes. I mean, pretty much anything. I'm amazed at the wide variety of devices that put out signals at 700 megahertz. Um, the machinery is fine. I had one case where a gentleman was welding at the base of the base station, at the base of the tower. And, uh, you know, I asked him, can you please stop welding for a few minutes and we'd check the stats. Uh, pretty much anything that runs on electricity and things that are not, we tend to think of maybe spurious emissions often as coming from things that would normally radiate RF energy at some other frequency. But again, it's amazing to me how many things generate signals that aren't supposed to. And in the presentation, for example, amplified television antennas, photocopiers, uh, the list just goes LED signs, for example. We see a lot of the LED or plasma display signs putting out spurious emissions. So really, it would not surprise me at all that anything that runs on electricity might be putting out a spurious emission into the uplink at 700 megahertz. Okay, great. Uh, we've had a couple of people ask about the mobile app uh, that is available. Can you just mention the name of that and where they can find it? Uh, it's, it's Interference Hunter. It's on the I, iOS, uh, the, the, the Apple App Store, and on whichever iOS App Store you use. I think there's several. I'm not an Android person personally myself. Um, if you go to our Interference Hunting website, I think the Learning Center that we have, we also provide a link to that. And that application, part of the reason we developed that was in a response to a lot of the questions we got because we, we get screenshots. I, I tell people, if you see an issue, send me a screenshot. Maybe it's something I've seen. And I was amazed at how often I got essentially the same screenshots over and over again. Uh, for example, BDAs or cable egress. Someone says, what is this? It's a BDA. How do you know? Well, I have 50 screenshots that look just like it. Uh, so we try to capture that information because it can save you a lot of time if you know exactly what you're looking for. And again, cable is an excellent example of this. If you see that cable egress, that spectrum of cable channels, it really narrows down the things that you have to investigate because it must be coming from something connected to the cable network. Uh, another thing that's been very useful in the application that we put in there uh, was a frequency lookup table because, again, spectrum refarming being kind of imperfect, a lot of times you'll say, oh, there's a signal from this. Or if it's a harmonic, we've seen harmonics from things all the way down in the FM broadcast band get up to 700 megahertz. We've seen pager systems. We've seen all kinds of things that you wouldn't think the harmonics would, would get up there. The seventh, eighth harmonic would get all the way up into LTE, but they do. So we put a number of utilities and applications in there and just made that available as a resource because when you're out in the field, it's really inconvenient to have to go back and boot up your laptop and find this information that you might have been looking for. Great. Um, so next question, about how far away can cable egress be detected and what are the factors determining the, uh, the distance? Well, you know, I'll start off by saying that I spend most of my time doing interference on wireless networks. And I've, I've been over the last few years, I've been talking about the egress issue for a few years and I've, I've actually come in contact with many, many, many people from the cable industry, obviously. And one of their perennial questions for me is, well, how loud does a leak have to be before it's a problem? Because they would like to have some way of measuring that. And the FCC actually mandates 
that they don't have egress above certain levels at certain distances at certain frequencies. Uh, there's some white papers on our Interference Hunting uh, Learning Center that actually discuss this issue. The question really, though, is not so much the level, as, as, as the uh, person asking the question mentioned, is how far away from the base station is it? And of course, that's a function of level. As a rule of thumb, I would say within a half mile of the E-node B uh, is where you'll typically find them. The closer in they are, and again, this, this picture of the guy in the bucket truck is a great example of the worst case scenario. Also, if they are above ground, they tend to get picked up by the E-node B better if they're buried. We have had cases where we've actually had underground feeder that was interfering interfering with an LTE network. But typically, if they're above ground and they're close to the base station, they're a bigger problem. Uh, in many cases, for example, the receiver that I use can pick up cable egress all over the place. But in many cases, if it's low level and far from the base station, it's probably not causing interference. It's the ones that are closer in, and again, rule of thumb, half mile maybe, um, that I would consider to be serious. And maybe anything that's above, within a half mile, and if it's a bug, maybe neg 90, neg 80, then almost certainly it's being picked up by the E-Node B. Great. Uh, next question. Can you provide an example of solving an interference problem where harmonics were the key to the solution? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the fluorescent lighting slide that I put up where it had, I, one of the first things I do, anytime I see a narrow band, and by narrow I'll say 100, 200 kilohertz wide or less, anytime I see a narrow band signal, the very first thing I do is say, Let's see if this is harmonic or something else. I mentioned the Interference Hunter app actually has a harmonic calculator. And the reason we put that in is because it's such a common thing. I'll see a signal at, say, 710 megahertz. And I'll go, I wonder if this is harmonic of something at, and do the math, right? If it's at 710, then it's going to be at 360, right? Somebody check my math here. Um, I'm sorry, 720 will be 360. And then I look to see if it's there. And why is this important? Well, because the harmonic is always, or pretty much always, lower level than the fundamental. So if I'm trying to track down the source of a signal whose harmonics are bothering me, it's easier for me to track down the lower frequency fundamental. It's louder, usually, uh, and it's easier to find. Now, in terms of practical examples, I mean, there, there are dozens of them, really. The fluorescent lighting example was actually harmonic all the way down to 200 megahertz. We've seen the, the um, RF card readers. If you go to a gas station and you have your little gas dongle and you hold it up to the, the touchless pad and then you can pump gas, some of those readers we've noticed that are working down to 200 and odd megahertz. Uh, they will put out spurs all the way up in 700 megahertz and above. So, I mean, there are lots and lots of examples of, of where harmonics. And intermodulation products also. We've had intermod products of harmonics, if you can believe that. Uh, it's a very common thing, so my advice is always, if you see a narrowband signal, check to see if it's a harmonic or something else. Great. Uh, next question. You, you touched on the importance of direction finding. Can you be more specific about the in-vehicle hardware setup? Well, there are different setups. So for direction finding, there's different ways of doing direction finding. And the, the one way to do it, which I tell people not to do, and I'm guilty of doing it myself all the time, is the driving around with one hand on the wheel and one hand on a directional antenna pointing it out of the windows. This is a horrible methodology. I do it. Okay, I'll admit that I do it. Anybody who's worked with me knows that I do it. But it's a horrible methodology. First, it's not safe. Uh, it gets a lot of strange looks and, and from people when you're pointing directional antennas out of the window. Uh, and it, it's from an RF point of view, it's not very good. So the next step up for that would be to have some kind of external antenna. So uh, a lot of times people use like a mag mount, Omni, they'll throw it on the roof. A uh, number of people I know in the cellular industry actually have Yagis on the roof and various clever ways of turning them around or sometimes they just circle in the parking lot. Um, it, what we've seen, though, is that in many cases what's helpful is to have a true direction-finding system. So there are direction-finding systems where instead of trying to get a bearing, in other words, make, move until my antenna is pointed at the highest signal level, I have a system where I say, here's a given frequency, tell me where it's coming from. So instead of waving my antenna around or driving around in circles in the parking lot, I type in a frequency and it goes, oh, it's coming from that way at 75 degrees or 112 degrees. Um, and those systems are very useful, um, especially if they're coupled together with software that can automatically do the triangulation or do a computation of where the likely position of the interferer is from. In LTE, I've seen this a number of times that you'll have a very short duration signal. I was in, probably shouldn't mention the city. I was in a city and we had intermodulation products that was mixing between a local pager and NOAA weather radio. And if you did an audio demodulation, you could hear that it's intermod. You could hear that it's mixing signals. But because the pager is intermittent, it would come on, blah, 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 off. Blah, blah, blah. This is murder to find with a directional handheld antenna. With an automatic direction finding system, it was very easy to find it. So this, these are the kinds of things where you want a vehicle mounted direction finding system. Uh, I don't want to discuss specific products or technologies. Again, if you visit our Interference Hunting Learning Center, there's a whole presentation of video on these automatic direction finding methodologies, and that might be a good place to start.
Great. Have you seen uh, a number of interferences from commercial or residential garage door openers? Not so much, really. Uh, again, would it surprise me pretty much anything? Uh, I'll tell you that a lot of times I will be driving along and in a certain neighborhood I'll see the same odd interfere coming from a number of houses. Uh, in some cases these are baby monitors I've seen. In some cases they're sort of like wireless speaker systems. Garage door openers I haven't exactly seen. I think I've heard of them. It might have been pre-LTE. Haven't come across any myself, but again would not be surprised at all. Uh, in many cases you will, I've been out interference hunting with one or the other network operator and we'll get to a, a building and of course nobody's home. So, and we will make a note to come back later and try to reach them by phone. And in some cases, we actually get entrance to the building and find out what it is. In some cases, it's, it goes away by itself when you knock on the door, so to speak. So, um, but in garage door openers, have not seen, but again, would not surprise me at all. Okay. Uh, another question is uh, in reference to the waterfall display you mentioned. Um, can you describe that just a little bit? And then also, are there any training materials available you can recommend? Well, I'll, I'll take that as two parts. So a waterfall, some people call it a waterfall, some people call it a spectrogram. It's essentially the same thing. If you think about a spectrum display, if I back these slides up, I'm going to see, if, is this backing up for, is that uh, a good example? I don't know if my slides backed up for the, the participants or not. Yeah, it did, it did. In a spectrum dispute, what you see is you see amplitude versus frequency. So the horizontal axis is frequency and the vertical amplitude. And pretty much I think everyone on this call understands that. In a waterfall diagram, the, the x-axis is still frequency. But what you have is the signals, and the reason it's sometimes called a waterfall, start at the top and move down. It's hard to see this on a still uh, screenshot. And what this does is it captures the, the behavior of signals over time. So the Vertical axis is time, usually newest at the top, oldest at the bottom. The horizontal axis is frequency, and intensity, the level, is represented by color. So, for example, as you get closer to red, that's a hotter color. Uh, that's higher levels of amplitude. As you get closer to blue or black, or however you've configured it, that's lower levels. I highly recommend, and you'll notice every single screenshot I put in this presentation has the combination of a spectrum plus waterfall or spectrogram view. And the reason is because, well, a couple of reasons. First of all, it shows you the behavior over time. If you have, for example, a signal that is oscillating over time, you can see that very clearly in a spectrogram. You'll see the signal moving back and forth. If you have an intermittent signal, the one that comes on and it goes away, comes on and goes away, you'll see this preserved in the, in the waterfall or spectrogram for some period of time, usually half a minute or so. It depends on the settings. And to me, this is very, very useful because as I'm driving, and there's a lot more driving in LTE than the previous technologies, I don't have to do a true person drive, and I don't have to stare one eye on the road, one eye on the instrument, which is not safe. I can glance down at the instrument every 10, 15 seconds and see, did anything change in the waterfall? If it did, then within the last 10, 15 seconds, I was close enough to whatever I'm looking for, turn around, go back, and look for it. Uh, in terms of training materials for it, um, one, one of my little pet peeves is there are absolutely no books on interference hunting that are really useful people in our industry. Uh, we do have a number of white papers, and I assume other people have white papers as well. Um, we also do offer classes, or classes are available on this. Really, the best thing to do is to just spend some time looking at waterfalls. It's usually very intuitive once you understand what you're looking at, and I've never met anybody who started using a waterfall or a spectrogram uh, who did not use it regularly after that. It's really a very, very powerful tool, especially in LTE networks. Great. Um, another question coming in. Is deliberate interference a big issue in LTE networks? <laughs> uh, yeah, deliberate interference. So by deliberate interference, I'm assuming that's what being, what's being meant here is jamming. Um, there was a time, maybe three, four years ago, when jammers were not uncommon. There were a lot of people operating and buying jammers, and jammers for cellular, jammers for GPS. And unfortunately, jammers are not precision devices. Commercial jammers, the ones that people used to be able to buy, and they would cause all kinds of problems. People would think, hey, you know, I'm just going to jam my business, my building. I can tell you all kinds of stories. But uh, what's happened is in the last about two years maybe, the FCC really cracked down on jammers. And so they, uh, you can no longer buy jammers on eBay to the best of my knowledge. A lot of the uh, China Direct and other websites that would sell jammers have been shut down or forced not to sell them anymore. We're seeing a lot less deliberate interference in terms of jammers than we used to simply because I think the availability of jammers is not there. The FCC really stepped up their enforcement action before LTE became widespread. Now there are certain cases, they're papers, you can find them on the internet or if someone, someone wants I can give them a reference for ways you can deliberately mess up LTE networks. Uh, it requires a pretty deep knowledge of LTE. 
and to date I have not seen that as well. So no, I wouldn't say there's as much deliberate interference to LTE as you might have seen with the kind of commercial, portable, personal jammers that you saw with 2G and 3G. Okay, we have uh, just about time for one more question. Um, so what tool did you use to ge generate the interference snapshots in the presentation today? Uh, the tool I used was, was our PR100 portable monitoring receiver. It's an FFT-based receiver as opposed to a SWEP spectrum analyzer. And again, the reason that I use that tool is it's the one I've been using for many, many years, and it's a very fast tool that's designed for interference hunting. Um, that said, there are certainly other tools that you could use to look for interference as well. That's just my, my personal preference and the tool that I like to use the best. Okay, great. That's about all the time we have today. Thank you for everyone that submitted their questions, and I apologize that we did not get to all of them. Um, but I want to thank everyone for attending Understanding Common Sources of Interference in LTE Networks, presented by Rodian and Schwartz. And I want to thank our presenter today, Paul Denisowski, Application Engineer at Rodian and Schwartz. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending.